evening. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute, and I have the honor of being your moderator this evening. The John Adams Institute brings the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands, and this evening that is the famous urban sociologist Sharon Zuken, albeit online. But there's light at the end of the tunnel, so stay with us. The John Adams is delighted to be partnering this evening with Pockhuis de Zwijger, this wonderful venue, and with the master city developer for this great urban books session. The Master City Developer is a program of the University in Delft and the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. More about that in a minute. The three of us have joined forces this evening to bring you this event with Sharon Zuken, who is joining us online from her home in New York City, to talk about her new book, The Innovation Complex, Cities, Tech, and the New Economy. We invite you in the audience to send in your questions, either via the chat or the Q&A function, as you like. Uh, and we hope that this will uh, indeed, thanks to your participation, be a very lively discussion. Sharon will first give a presentation about her book, and then we will have some time for questions from me, from you, and from our panel members. And our panel this evening is made up of Rinke Sonnefeld, who is the director of Innovation Quarter, the development agency for the greater Rotterdam, The Hague region. And Katja Rusinovic. Hello, Katja, welcome. Uh, she is a lector of urban development at the Haagse Hoogschool. We were also to have with us this evening Frank van Oort, who is a professor of urban and regional development at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. But unfortunately, at the last minute, he was unable to join us. We also have a little present for you. Pockhaus des Weiger organizes an extensive two-year program called Designing Cities for All. It focuses on the role of designers in shaping and creating cities for and by everyone. With code DCFA2122, I'll repeat that, give you time to grab a pen, DCFA2122, DCFA2122, you get a 10% discount at Atheneum Bookstore on the Innovation Complex. Use the code at checkout or order directly from the link on the program page of tonight's event. On behalf of the Master City Developer, we have with us this evening Walter Jan Verheul, who is a researcher at the University in Delft in Urban Development Management. He's the coordinator of the postgraduate degree program, and he is also the coordinator of the yearly Great Books Session. So, Walter, I was hoping you could tell us more about the Master City Developer and the Great Urban Book Sessions. Yes, Tracy, thank you. Uh, the Master City Developer is a postgraduate master program for urban professionals that work on strategic level. Uh, think of uh, urban planners, urban designers, urban investors, property developers. It's a two-year program organized by uh, Delft University and Erasmus University. We have already uh, over 300, 350 alumni. And um, it's since a few years not only a two-year master program, but we also offer short-term courses, short-term modules for seven or eight weeks, one day in a week. Uh, and you can choose courses like uh, urban economics, urban resilience, or uh, urban governance, uh, urban investment, uh, urban design. But especially I would like to mention uh, today uh, the course uh, International Urban Development because that course uh, will be held in New York City. Uh, since a few years we organized this course in New York City to learn comparatively about cities, uh, to visit uh, interesting urban places, to go to uh, New York universities. And one of the uh, professors in that course is uh, Sharon Zukin. Ah. Uh, eh? The famous uh, uh, professor of sociology, uh, Sharon Zukin. I think she's one of, if not the uh, most famous uh, professor of urban sociology who writes about uh, the ever-changing urban environment in New York City and in other cities. Uh, two years ago, uh, during a lecture, in that module, uh, she talked about a new book that was coming up uh, about urban innovation. And uh, after that, we said, well, 
it will be great if we invite Professor Sharon Zukin for our great books sessions in the Netherlands. Uh, as MCD, we organize a yearly event, the Great uh, Urban uh, Books Sessions, uh, as a kind of a public event to share our ideas, to exchange some knowledge about uh, cities and to talk about famous books. We have had uh, famous uh, authors and books uh, such as Edward Glazer, Triumph of the City, uh, Duke Saunders, The Arrival City, um, we have had uh, Richard Sennett, uh, uh, People in Dwelling, Cities in Dwelling, uh, Charles Landry, The Art of City Making. Uh, in Pakhuis Zwijger, we organized a session with uh, Jan Gill uh, and his book um, Cities and People. So, and uh, tonight uh, we will organize this session for you. The Innovation Complex, and yeah, it's my pleasure that we can do that together with the John. Adams Institute, the Institute for Dutch American Culture in the Netherlands, American Culture in the Netherlands, and you, Tracy, are the director of that institute. So uh, great that you will moderate this event tonight. Thank you very much, Walter Jan, and I am delighted to give the floor to Sharon to give her presentation about what she learned in the world of tech. Good <laughs> morning. Uh, don't get scared. That's one of the very few words of Dutch I remember from a very pleasant year that I spent at the Urban Research Center at the University of Amsterdam a number of years ago. I am grateful to the Master City Developer Program and to Walter Jan for bringing me back to Amsterdam, although only in this virtual form and to the John Adams Institute and Tracy Metz, an old friend, uh, and the director of the Institute. I uh, wish we could all be in person together at uh, the Parkhaus des Weiger because I know that I would really learn a lot from the experience of being there. But thank you to Liz and Robert at the Parkhaus for organizing the production details of this evening's event. You know, every startup has an origin story, and some of those origin stories are true. My origin story is that I am not an expert, I'm not an urban planner, I'm just a sociologist who a few years ago became very interested in understanding how capitalism was trying to reform itself by integrating new forms of digital production. So if my general question was, how do new forms of capitalism develop? And how does capitalism regain its charisma? I had to look at digital technology, capital investment in tech firms, what was driving startup founders, and how did a new workforce of computer savvy people get formed? But other sociologists and most writers about innovation and about digital technology never placed any of these processes. For me, who always writes about cities, the question was, how do these new forms of capitalism become emplaced? How do they get put in specific cities? How do they reshape the city around them? And how does the city impact their development? Now, when I started to look at these issues in 2015, the production of digital technology had become urban. It was being emplaced all around me in San Francisco, in London, in Shenzhen, and certainly in New York. It was in Shanghai that I came to the realization that what I was looking at was a global innovation complex that was pretty much the same in every city, regardless of the government and the culture and the financial arrangements that supported it. I was invited to go to a book launch by a friend of mine in, uh, in Shanghai and the book launch took place at a completely new construction. It was a mixed use development with new offices that were meant to be for tech and creative startups. And of course there were 
you know, the whiteboard, uh, the whiteboards and the, the open space plans and the obligatory espresso cafe. But I was reminded of a very different landscape on the Brooklyn waterfront in Dumbo, where old warehouses and factories were redeveloped for tech and creative offices with the obligatory espresso cafes, but the whole place looked very different. In each case, I was seeing the same phenomenon. And the phrase that came to me to try to describe it was innovation complex. Number one, an innovation complex is a set of buildings often concentrated in specific districts where it was expected that companies and people would come together and make innovation. And every city government wanted to make these. But innovation complex also means complex in a more psychological sense, like an inferiority complex, because every city was now afraid of falling behind every other city in terms of attracting jobs of the future, industries of the future, and economic growth. So this was a good moment, 2015, to begin to look at the emplacement of an urban innovation complex. New York City, by that point, had emerged from the crises of the dot-com bust of the year 2000, the 9-11 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, and the 2008 financial crisis to be called the number two startup ecosystem in the world, with the usual kind of overstatement that involves. But we were, we were now number two after San Francisco. And The Economist, with an even greater sense of hype, said, this is the Cambrian moment, as though we were standing at the cusp of history after a long wilderness of prehistory. Now, what does it mean for the tech industry to become emplaced in an urban landscape? Unlike the campuses of big tech companies in exurban research centers like Silicon Valley, and unlike the Greenfields high-tech parks in China, urban tech production in older cities like Amsterdam or Rotterdam, New York or San Francisco is integrated into the fabric of existing buildings. Sometimes they are old dock lands, old factories, old warehouses, old office buildings, rarely new construction, at least in New York, rarely new construction, rarely greenfield construction because we don't have any vacant space. And these tech implantations are usually without corporate logos or tech place finders. And you don't know, even if you live in the city, that tech districts and tech production is taking place all around you. And this is true in New York, even though we have, according to most estimates, 9,000 startups, 100 accelerators, the large corporate offices of Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, and even Amazon, and media companies that now consider themselves tech companies like the New York Times and Condé Nast. And we have financial companies that hire thousands of software engineers like Goldman Sachs. So all in all, when I began my research in New York a few years ago, we already had here 250,000 to 350,000 jobs that either produce digital technology or use digital technology. Now, how was I, a sociologist, supposed to understand this emerging landscape that most people could not even see? Looking around, going around, visiting, interviewing people, going to events that I had never heard of before, like hackathons, meeting venture capitalists whom I did not know before, I decided that the tech ecosystem is made up of three kinds of spaces. Discursive spaces, 
including all of that hype about number two, number one startup ecosystem. Organizational spaces made up of big companies, small startups, uh, industry associations that represent tech firms, civic tech, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, and geographical spaces. So I invite you to join me to learn as I learned about New York's tech ecosystem. So we're going to make a journey by video that I made with the documentary filmmaker, Alice Arnold in February, 2020, just a few weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic began. And we're going to go through video to Manhattan, the island at the center of the world as Tracy's predecessor, the director, the previous director of the John Adams Institute wrote about. So let's go to the video. New York's wealth has always been rooted in its waterfront. In the old days, the wealth came from trade with docks and warehouses as the physical connectors between the city and the world economy. Today, a growing portion of the city's wealth comes from tech production for digital media, business software, and online shopping. Tech and creative offices are the new connectors to the global economy. They make up an innovation complex and also a new landscape of power. You can see that I speak as a sociologist and uh, not a practitioner in the tech economy, since I see the emergence of, uh, of these new forms of production as a, a new landscape of power. The timeline for building this landscape was shaped by both technological innovations and cycles of growth and crisis. From the 1990s, it seemed the dot-com boom left no tangible effects, but in fact, they did, organizational effects, and individuals who became organizational nodes in creating the software tech ecosystem of the 21st century. This ecosystem started with smartphones and apps in the early 2000s. It was really kicked into gear in Europe as well as the United States by the financial crisis of 2008. Software and demand for software grew enormously so that by 2011, the internet pioneer and entrepreneur Mark Andreessen was writing, software is eating the world. Cities pivoted from the creative city model which was not creating enough jobs to uh, deal with the effects of the 2008 recession to innovation district models. New landscapes of power began to emerge all over the world. Amsterdam in 2016 won the title of European Union Innovation Capital with a lot more social innovation than was emphasized in New York at the time, but I would bet a similar landscape of power. Let's go back to our video journey. During the dot-com boom of the 1990s, new media companies clustered along Broadway from 23rd Street to Wall Street. The skyscraper canyon of Broadway got a new name, Silicon Alley. But this early tech economy suffered a series of nasty shocks. The dot-com stock crash in 2000-2001, the 9-11 World Trade Center attack, and the 2008 financial crisis. After the crisis, with new software and mobile technology, startups began to grow in New York's industries. These startups attracted venture capitalists and investment banks and the New York City Economic Development Corporation staked out a strategy to make New York a technology center. The New York City Economic Development Corporation, which is basically the economic development agency of the city, 
is the most important city government agency for any landscape of power today in New York, in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, or anywhere else. The ferries are a symbol of the kinds of initiatives that EDC put in place in the early 2000s. They were not profitable. They, the ferries are still not profitable, certainly not during a pandemic, but they were strategically important for linking the different geographical spaces of the new tech ecosystem. The crucial point about the Economic Development Corporation in New York is that it is the public agency that controls city-owned land, including the old industrial complexes on the Brooklyn waterfront, but also a lot of Midtown Manhattan space from which EDC earns revenues. And it's those rents that EDC is able to invest in the tech ecosystem. They have a big budget, but very little public control. On the other hand, EDC set, is set up to be a legitimate public partner for business. In 2008, this agency made a crucial break with their past by developing strategic planning or at least strategic analysis for the very first time, surprising, but eventually this is what they realized they had to do because of the 2008 crisis. They set up a center for economic transformation within EDC, which consulted with business leaders in every sector, and gradually formed a consensus that what New York City needed was a startup ecosystem. A lot of business leaders at the time really did not accept that. To make this ecosystem, New York City needed a lot, of, a lot more software engineers. And this was the beginning of one of the biggest EDC initiatives, the um, Applied Sciences Initiative that benefited the major universities of the city, especially Columbia and NYU, and led to the development of a postgraduate engineering school, which was planned to be entrepreneurial, uh, called Cornell Tech. When a new mayor was elected in 2013, uh, he had much more of a social justice agenda, but he continued the same direction of the EDC, adding more social justice criteria to their decisions. In 2015, for example, EDC developed a tech talent pipeline run by the Office of Small Business Services in the city government to bring a more diverse workforce to the major tech companies that by then had set up shop in New York, as well as to tech startups. In 2020, another example of EDC's initiatives, uh, the agency coordinated emergency production of personal protective equipment during the first months of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that from my point of view, EDC and the city government were crucial movers of the urban tech ecosystem in New York. Before we continue our journey with the video, let's look at a map to see where those ferries go. We are going to go uh, uh, up the west side of Manhattan, up the Hudson River uh, from the Wall Street area to Google in Chelsea. Then we're going to hop a little bit farther north to Midtown West, to Hudson Yards. And then we're going to pretend we're taking a taxi from the west side of Manhattan to the east side. And we're going to take a ferry again to Roosevelt Island to see Cornell Tech. And then we're going to take another ferry to come down the East River between Brooklyn and Queens to visit the Brooklyn waterfront. 
So that's the route that we're now going to continue on. Let's go to the video again, starting from the old financial district of Wall Street. Real estate developers were eager to fill office buildings that had been emptied by the 2008 financial crisis, as well as millions of square feet of new office development, starting with the World Trade Center. Companies benefited from subsidies to rebuild the district after 9-11. Media and tech firms, like Condé Nast and Spotify, moved into the new World Trade Center. Financial companies hired thousands of engineers to develop fintech. Wall Street is now a tech and media hub. Google has a big presence along the waterfront in Chelsea. They opened their first New York office in the early 2000s with one marketing employee. Now they have 7,000 people working in five buildings, starting with the old Nabisco Bakery building near the High Line. Think of it as a move from chocolate chips to silicon chips, although of course the chips are not manufactured here. This was a good moment for the area. In 2006, construction on the High Line had just begun, and a special zoning district connected its financing to real estate developers. Google now has three million square feet here, including YouTube production studios in the Chelsea Market Building and offices in the old Port Authority headquarters. And they're expanding to a new campus west of Soho. In 2014, the northern end of the High Line opened, creating a pathway from Google to Hudson Yards. Most people know Hudson Yards for luxury housing, restaurants, and shopping but it is also part of the innovation complex, where new corporate offices meld big tech and the city's biggest financial firms. BlackRock, J.P. Morgan, and Wells Fargo have offices here. So do Time Warner, HBO, Alphabet's Sidewalk Labs, and the German software company, SAP. Facebook has leased more than one million square feet at Hudson Yards. And Amazon? Well, it's around the corner. On the East River waterfront, another important part of the ecosystem has developed. Cornell Tech, a partnership between Cornell University and Israel Institute of Technology, was initiated by the city government in 2010, after the financial crisis. It's a graduate school to train elite software engineers, app developers, and business students. The idea is that they will create startups in New York or get good jobs with the city's major tech employers and financial firms. Cornell Tech brings students and professors into collaborations with businesses. That's how the school, like the city's other universities, encourages innovation and entrepreneurship and capitalizes on faculty and student startups. You can, you can see again that I have uh, perhaps a more critical view of the tech ecosystem than someone from inside it. Uh, what other people might call the triple helix partnership between business, universities, and government, I would view as a form of academic capitalism. Since the 1990s, universities in the United States have been underfunded by state governments. And they have sought more and more funding from the private sector. Um, European universities have gone through a similar period, but more recently. Uh, from the point of view of business, and by 2009, also from the point of view of the New York City government, New York's universities were not entrepreneurial enough. And so the Economic Development Corporation of the city government took as one of its missions to help the universities of the city become more entrepreneurial. So uh, what Cornell Tech is, is uh, a big triple helix implantation, but it was pretty much replicated by Columbia University 
uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and also by NYU, particularly in Brooklyn, where New York University, a private university, uh, merged with a historic engineering school. The uh, the trick of the or the trick or the the, stra the the strategic trick of the Triple Helix Partnership is uh, first to uh, join business and engineering professors and students to make marketable innovations, and second to leverage private and uh, leverage public investment to raise private investment. And this was done extremely successfully, not by EDC, but by the not-for-profit economic development corporation that manages the Brooklyn Navy Yard, a city-owned old industrial property that by law maintains control over its own rent revenues. And so the Brooklyn Navy Yard represents perhaps the best example in many dimensions of New York's urban tech ecosystem. Number one, it's on city owned land, which permits it to keep rents low. Number two, it has the autonomy of a not-for-profit corporation that does not have to make a profit to satisfy investors, and it has control of its own rent revenues. It doesn't have to turn those revenues over to EDC. Number three, the Brooklyn Navy Yard has a social mission to sustain and modernize manufacturing and provide jobs for local residents who do not have a university education. This was a mission that achieved gains, as I mentioned before, during the pandemic, because the pandemic both accelerated development of the tech ecosystem and revealed severe inequalities between uh, the, the more privileged uh, tech and professional workers who were able to work remotely and the in-person workers who were not able to protect themselves from uh, the public health crisis. Let's see the last part of the video and look more closely at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Another short ferry ride away the Brooklyn waterfront has gradually emerged as New York's new media and manufacturing district. Dot-com firms started out here in the 90s, in Dumbo's old warehouses and factories. By the early 2000s, digital branding firms, media artists, and other startups formed a tech and creative hub. At the same time, the Brooklyn Navy Yard went through a transformation. In 2004, Steiner Studios for film and TV production opened there. This was the first large-scale production space to come along after the last shipbuilders moved out. Steiner Studios anchored the reimagining of the Navy Yard as a part of the city's new economy. In the 2010s, the Navy Yard signed with a real estate developer to create new lab an accelerator, incubator, and workspace for both hardware and software startups. The Navy Yard is one of the few places in the tech ecosystem that integrates manufacturing and tech offices, and a venture capitalist's office, too. More than 100 startups work side by side at New Lab and connect to potential investors. Other startups are working with urban agriculture, transportation, and alternative energy. One company here designed this robotic coffee maker. Cool technology, but no baristas. The Brooklyn Navy Yard complex represents the best vision for now of what the ecosystem can become. Traditional manufacturing, new manufacturing, urban transportation, and urban farms. This is New York's new economy. Yet its future depends on continued real estate development, tech job growth, and city government support. Not an easy combination.
during the pandemic, of course, while so many people were working, have been working remotely, offices are empty, restaurants have been shut, 50, 15 to 20% of office space in New York City and San Francisco is still empty. There are so many open questions that we face. What will the recovery from the pandemic be like? How many people will work remotely in the tech field? How many people at tech startups will not be in big cities at all, but will be working remotely? Will the geographical distribution of the workforce be echoed by the continued or accelerated geographical distribution of tech investment? Suppose we all become more dependent on big tech companies like Amazon. What will this mean for cities? What does this mean when the corporate headquarters of the companies we depend on is not in the same city? I'm going to stop now so that everybody else gets a chance to speak and to ask questions. I hope in the discussion, we will get to points I haven't raised and maybe you'll ask me about Amazon and HQ2. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's so, so illuminating. And the book is a wonderful mix of reportage and reflection that I think really added a lot to um, our awareness of the impact of this new economy. One thing I was wondering about, just a, a simple question to begin with, how long have you worked on this project? Um, five years. Mm. Five years. I was wondering because in the last few years, we've seen the attitude of the general public and also of policymakers towards the big tech world change. And I wondered, did you see that happen during the course of your research? Yes and no. Uh, yes, we had a huge um, uh, uh, groundswell of discontent with Amazon uh, at the time. Uh, that uh, the city and state governments offered huge subsidies to the company to build their second headquarters, H a second North American headquarters, HQ2, in New York. But uh, we have not seen in New York uh, a, a big uh, outburst of protest against tech companies or against big tech companies, uh, not like you see in Berlin. Uh, we don't have exactly the same kind of protest against uh, tech for causing gentrification. I think that's because the New York City economy is much more diversified and the, the, the richest people in New York are not uh, tech executives like um, Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg. And they're not people who became rich on tech IPOs the way they are in San Francisco because New York IPOs are not as big as Silicon Valley and San Francisco IPOs. So who Plus, are the richest people? Well, you know, exactly. The richest people in, in New York City uh, are first financial sector people, managers of private equity funds and hedge funds, uh, the, the presidents of the big banks, uh, people who are celebrities like uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce, um, uh, uh, investors from overseas, uh, whether they're corrupt dictators or uh, other people who manage to siphon off great funds from the, the countries where they operate and put them into New York real estate. We, you know, th those are, uh, uh, you know, maybe more new, rich, rich, richy, rich people causing gentrification or causing housing prices mm -hmm. to escalate drastically in New York. In contrast to San Francisco, where uh, tef tech wealth, uh, especially wealth from IPOs, has really uh, uh, flooded into the housing market. Mm -hmm. I was really struck you, you touched on it in your uh, introduction uh, by the term academic capitalism. I think uh, we all now know the term surveillance capitalism, thanks to Shoshana Zuboff, but this is its sister, academic capitalism. And just for the fun of it, I noted the 
uh, companies that were involved in the two degree programs at Cornell Tech. It is an amazing lineup. Hearst, Medium, Facebook, BetterWorks, Tumblr, WordPress, and the New York Times were involved in the first degree program and in the second one with Pfizer, United Health Corporation, and a medical college, and a couple others. That means these universities are huge economic powerhouses in their own right. It's a fascinating trend, but what do you think of it? Is this a good thing? And I hope our panel members would also reflect on that, what, what we expect of uh, how uni entrepreneurial a university here should be. What do you think, Susan? What do you think of this trend, Sharon? Sharon, but the uh, the phrase academic capitalism is not mine. I have to give uh, full credit to uh, Sheila Slaughter and Gary Rhodes, who wrote a book uh, by that title back in the 1990s. Uh, it was already clear at that time that universities in the U.S. at least were under pressure to be more entrepreneurial. That means to capitalize on discoveries by their faculty and students. Naturally, as a sociologist, I'm not in that exalted group of people whose innovations are marketable or uh, you know, desire, desirable entrepreneurial um, uh, umbrellas for anybody to seek shelter under. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I guess I'm old fashioned, but I like to think of universities as being a little bit vocational and, and, and able to um, uh, uh, make students well prepared for their jobs, but uh, also, uh, uh, they they have to be most the university should be mostly um, liberal uh, liberal arts institutions that uh, acquaint students with history and philosophy, and I'd like to say you know rhetoric and all those things people used to study hundreds of years ago. Uh, <laughs> in, in other words, I think that universities should continue their historical mission of helping people to learn how to think rather than helping them to make uh, 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 developments that can be uh, sold by businesses. Interesting. I'm sure we'll come back to this in a moment. We have a question from the audience from Martin Deval, who is himself uh, organizing a media architecture biennial next year, to be held next year. Um, you briefly mentioned the role of civic tech in the innovation complex, he says. And he was hoping that you could elaborate on that. Do you see civic tech as part of the capitalist development paradigm, or could it contribute to alternative ways of organizing tech innovation? Uh, at best, it could contribute to all kinds of open alternatives. In New York, um, as elsewhere in, in the US and elsewhere in the world, uh, uh, civic tech depends on uh, financing from outside civic tech, that is uh, financing mostly from uh, partners in the private sector. So really how autonomous can it, can it ever be? Um, civic tech, uh, it, 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 um, which I write about uh, in, in the book as one of those organizational spaces that has been important to, to the development of New York's tech ecosystem, Civic Tech um, uh, is, uh, uh, presents itself here, at least, in terms of uh, a, a nonpartisan, non-ideological set of platforms to make government work better, to make it more transparent. Uh, it, it's a general sort of democratic access that is being, um, is being offered. And uh, it's, it, you would have to take several more steps, I think, to move away from partnerships with big tech companies to develop a really autonomous new technology. I'd like to touch on one other important theme in your book before we go to um, a little video and then onto our panel. One of the most important themes in your book, Sharon, is inequality. Uh, and I'm really glad that you discussed this in depth. Um, I think just one simple sentence from the book shows us where you're coming from. The more successful the innovation complex, the less livable the city. Private investors reap most of the rewards. 
is this just a given? Is this something we have to learn to live with? Or is there a response? Is there a way we can prevent the new economy uh, just from widening the gap between the haves and the have-nots? There has to be a way to deal with this, right? And the, the way has to come uh, under pressure from the public or not, uh, has to come from government. Uh, you know, we have taxation policies. We have negotiations between the public sector and the private sector for all kinds of things from uh, pers uh, persuading or encouraging uh, tech companies to offer internships to the city's population uh, and helping to train the future tech workforce to, um, uh, to uh, building products that are socially responsible. Uh, we have procurement policies. One of the reasons that uh, uh, big tech companies like to be in New York City is that by U.S. standards, it's a really big market, and it's a city government that should spend a lot of money on modernizing infrastructure. So government has many ways, I think, to leverage its decisions, leverage its expenditures, and really press all companies, especially tech companies now to be socially responsible. But it's funny to think of persuading a company like Amazon to provide more local jobs when we know, thanks to your book and to reading the newspapers, that Amazon created 30 jobs for people from the local uh, uh, social housing project. Laughable. Exactly. You know, I, I'm reading a new book by the Politico journalist Alec McGillis now about Amazon. It's called Fulfillment. And <laughs> it, 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 yes, a good, good play on words. Uh, and um, he documents that uh, Amazon played exactly the same strategy in locating its warehouses in the United States before it ran the competition for HQ2. And that's exactly the strategy that the company, like many other companies in the past, have uh, has put in place in Europe now, uh, playing one town or city against another for the siting of warehouses or fulfillment centers. And uh, of course, and of course the promise, uh, the promise the potential of jobs. So, uh, you know, there, there must be some collaboration among cities not to reproduce the same uh, response to companies like Amazon, but to develop a strategy and a set of criteria that companies must meet. Sounds there's like there's a little bit of wishful thinking in there, Sharon. There is indeed, yes. <laughs> um, we have another question, but let's first go to our video and then on to our panel. Amsterdam's the city of meandering canals, breathtaking architecture and a vibrant culture, with museums that attract millions of tourists each year. The city's in fact become one of the world's most important hubs for digital innovation, with $600 million invested in the startup sector in the past two years alone. We have become a hotbed for collaboration and innovation, a real life testing ground that inspires metropolitan areas across the globe. We believe our solution driven mentality can help address the various issues affecting humanity. The Rotterdam Innovation District is a fusion of forces of two former port areas. Here, creative minds and whiz kids meet tanned craftsmen and accomplished professionals. A place to develop, to grow and to share. Regio Eindhoven. A place where people with passion for technique and onderzoek elkaar vonden. Hier veranderen nog steeds doeners, denkers, onderzoekers en bestuurders samen. Alles wat wordt vastgepakt in oplossingen. By the Wadden Sea, bordering Germany and the Enns River, we find a large, beautiful area with ample opportunities for developing businesses and setting up companies. E and recycling are the core businesses of the region. 
they all have the same upbeat music. Huh? Let's <laughs> let's uh, on with the future. <laughs> um, Everybody in the audience, send us your questions. I'm sitting here waiting. Don't let me down. <laughs> and I would like to ask uh, Katja Rusinovich to um, reflect on, uh, on Sharon's uh, thoughts in this book. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you also for having me and to have me reflect on the work of uh, Sharon. I think it's an um, incredible book to read. Um, as um, it describes this emerging landscape whom I'm not familiar with either. <laughs> I'm also just a sociologist, but I haven't <laughs> written a book about it. But I really love the, the description of, in detail, the, the ecosystem. So uh, it, it was a pleasure reading it. Um, what struck me most was, you already mentioned it, um, uh, Tracy, the more successful the city, the less democratic and the less livable cities become. So I think that's... An, I think that's something we will be discussing on later on as well, because I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind. But also, and that maybe also relates to the question I would like to ask um, Sharon is, um, you mentioned that who benefits and who benefits not uh, from the innovation complex is also a political choice. And that's also mm. something you already reflected on. But you've seen the, the film um, on all these Dutch cities uh, who also present themselves as the new technological innovation hub. What would the most import, important lessons be? Um, uh, what would you suggest to our cities, Sharon, um, to keep in mind, given the fact that it is, to a certain extent, a political choice of who benefits and who doesn't, ben who cannot benefit from it? Uh, I, I, I uh, thank you very much for your comments. I feel very uh, shy to offer advice or suggestions to anyone, uh, <laughs> truly. Uh, but uh, I, I can only uh, I can only say that uh, 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 government uh, and uh, the elected if officials should remember that they represent the public. They represent everyone, and uh, the, the, they they must try to uh, try to persuade. Uh, uh, companies uh, and investors to work with everyone for everyone. Uh, this is, you know, this is this is obviously very difficult. We have seen in the past uh, couple of weeks uh, Amazon's strength in preventing workers in the the state of Alabama uh, from forming from uh, desiring or voting to to form a labor union uh, while paying those workers relatively well but working them very hard so I you know I, I would ask governments to reflect upon the the old industrial age and to ask themselves how they can avoid recreating the same inequalities and the same hardships as in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Rinke Sonnefeld, what struck you the most about uh, uh, the story of our new economy? Well, a lot, and to be honest, because uh, this is my daily business. This is what I do for a living, to work on these innovation ecosystems and to have a, a peek through your lens, through the eyes of just the sociologists, as you called yourself. <laughs> that was, for me, um, thought-provoking. And of course, my, my first response was, OK, this, this is how it works in the US, and this is not how it works in Europe. But then... Um, I, I I took a look at, at the mirror and tried to reflect, okay, maybe it's not that oblivious what's happening in, in the US, in New York, is happening here. But look at Amsterdam. It's almost impossible for an average primary school teacher or a p uh, police officer to afford to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And it's due to the success of this city. But it's due to the success. And I think what we're all looking for uh, is how can you reap the benefits, the economic benefits of being a successful city and also balance the um, possible uh, social negative consequences of it. Uh, because um, without the economic success, I, I can't imagine um, a successful city in these days and ages 
uh, without um, a vivid innovation ecosystem, without a vivid uh, startup uh, climate, without um, big tech companies being there. Um, although in the, the region I'm more responsible for, we don't see that many big tech companies, and I think we talk about it later, what, what are the difference. But what I'm looking for is, do you know any examples of American cities, to start with, that have done better than New York has, or San Francisco, which is even worse than New York, I guess, because uh, it really hurts your stomach if you're in San Francisco to see that so many homeless people are there, while uh, the minimum uh, wage at the moment, I, I, I heard, is $120,000 to make a living in San Francisco, which is, which is crazy. But do you have any successful examples in America where cities were successful in reaping the economic benefits, but also make it work for all the citizens? I'm not sure that we have any any good examples. Uh, you know, homelessness is a, is a national problem in the United States. It's not only a problem of New York and San Francisco, or even a problem only of big cities. And in fact, the the density of urbanization in the Netherlands is already a a positive uh, factor in contrast to the development of smaller tech hubs or innovation hubs in the United States that now, especially now uh, at, the, uh, at the end perhaps of the pandemic are uh, growing even faster than they grew before. Cities like Boulder, Colorado and Austin, Texas, where uh, because, uh, uh, because of the, the, the lack of density of construction, uh, new housing is built farther and farther from the centers of the city and farther and farther from jobs so that people are commuting, commuting by automobile because they don't have mass transit systems. And the environmental costs as well as the psychic costs on individuals are, are terrible. Uh, plus in, in Austin, there is such huge demand for housing now that that the construction of housing cannot keep up with it. So, uh, and then of course there's Miami, which is another emerging and competitive uh, tech hub that is promoting itself uh, rapidly now to receive migrants, pandemic migrants from <laughs> New York and other places. And yet Miami is experiencing rising floodwaters even in normal times now. So um, if I look at the places that uh, are growing in tech jobs, I see really bad conditions, physical conditions even, of trying to build out the city for an anticipation of jobs. So I don't, um, I don't know what a what a, a good case would be, and uh, you know, I often when I'm asked this this question about some urban issue, I say, yeah, I guess New York is not such a bad case after all for the U.S. You did mention in your book, Sharon, how uh, the uh, Economic Development Corporation and many other institutions in the tech economy in New York invest in businesses that are supposed to bring jobs and educate people. And what do they ultimately do? Yes, they have their office, maybe on Silicon Alley, but the software is written by somebody living in uh, uh, Sioux Falls. And the uh, portable solar panels, I think was one of the examples in your book, are, are made in China. So the city is spending bundles of money to stimulate this economy, but it's actually uh, not coming into the city, uh, certainly not all of it. Not, not all of it, but that's, you know, that was the case before. Uh, while I was doing, as, as, as you, as you uh, I write about this, this distribution of both jobs and distribution of investment by New York-based uh, venture capitalists, um, even startups uh, uh, hire people from different parts of the world to write their software uh, while they may, they may maintain their uh, top management and marketing people in New York City. 
So, you know, some companies do that. Some companies don't do that. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what is the best way to encourage companies to hire up and down the line in the same place where they are headquartered, because that's really the kind of, of varied or, or balanced economic growth that cities need. We have a, an interesting question from uh, Hans Hugo Smit, who also wrote a very insightful review of your book on, uh, I believe it was uh, Gebietsontwikkeling. Um, do, do cities really need tech to flourish? Have we sold our soul to the devil? Well, I agree with the comment that was made earlier. This is This is what the economy is now. And whether we're talking about uh, jobs in finance or jobs in uh, food service, we're talking about digitalization in some form or healthcare. I mean, almost everything is in the course of being digitized now. So this is it. Or as you know, some people whom I interviewed for the book uh, said to me, uh, does anybody talk about the electricity industry when every business uses electricity? You know, eventually <laughs> we'll stop talking about the tech industry because everybody Everything is, is using tech. Yeah. 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 Rinke? Yeah, on the, one hand, on the one hand, everything is tech, but I think we have to make a clear distinction between big tech, all these huge platform technologies, which is winner-takes-it-all mentality, and a lot of innovation that is happening with mm. smaller startups, scale-ups, who bring a lot of good uh, new inventions to the market, whether it is on cl clean energy, whether it's on life sciences, math technology, etc. And I think we, we have to make some distinction there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because what we see and what we talk about a lot is the, the negative effects of the, the large ones, the, the Amazons, the Googles, um, but the if, the if you, statistics if you, Sharon gave on the amount of square feet that Google has in New York is just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And you know, the question a city has to ask itself is, is this something we want at mm -hmm. this scale? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I think also on a, on a maybe not that high level, um, it's also important with regard to, to have an inclusive labor market. So to have... Um, from the, from bottom up, also the, the lower vocational education programs involved in all these also small scale startups, Absolutely. and uh, to have the labor market inclusive for from lower vocational to higher vocational to um, university degrees, so to have them all implemented within the area of development. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and there might be a benefit here of tech because if you want to become a lawyer, you have to go to law, law school. If you want to become an investment banker, you have to study economic or business first. If you want to become a techie, the only thing you have to do is start learning coding at a young age. So being done in a proper way, a tech can lead to a more equal society. Hmm. Being yes, done in a proper yes, way. That, yes, that's, yes, that's true. But, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the uh, career paths that are open to people who do not go to university in New York and who go instead to boot camp programs, some of which in New York are funded by the New York City government and you know, that provide um, full tuition scholarships to, uh, uh, to low income people to complete a, a coding course. Uh, those boot camps are not as well regarded in tech companies as universities. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, 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 the ceiling that people can rise to with uh, a lower status tech education might be a lower ceiling than other people. Mm -hmm. And then if people want to, to start their own tech company, they need access to capital. Uh, and so far, it's been much easier for people to start out bootstrapping themselves with um, funds from family and friends and then to to apply to be in accelerator programs. I'm speaking of, of New York now. It might be easier in the Netherlands to to do this uh, starting to, to found a company starting from uh, a very uh, low socioeconomic base. 
And so it's, it's much easier to go from, say, an Ivy League education or a family that can put some investment capital into a startup uh, than to go from, uh, from a low-income family without a university education to, to, uh, uh, to open your, your own, uh, your own mm. small startup. Mm. One of the career paths that you sketched in the book was the couple who started, um, was it called the Dog, dog Spot? Houses. The Dog yeah. Houses. I've actually seen yeah. one in Detroit. I didn't know what I was looking at. They're uh, yeah. electronic dog houses on the street where you can park your dog while you go in and have dinner or go shopping. Brilliant. But they bootstrapped themselves all the way up to a yeah. successful company. Uh, we have a question uh, regarding the role of the public sector. I think this is really interesting. You said that the public sector should come up with a list of requirements together for uh, big companies like Amazon. But, of course, the big tech companies always have more resources than the public sector does. What is, in your opinion, the right way to stay one step ahead of these companies for the public sector? And I'll bet you have something to say about that, too, Rink. Sharon? Uh, uh, I, I defer to Rinka because uh, this 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 really is uh, the perpetual problem. Uh, I don't know, you know. Many years ago, I started out studying deindustrialization in the United States and France, and I was I was really overwhelmed by how academic researchers are always not just one step but three steps behind the private sector. <laughs> so I don't I I, uh, I don't I don't know. I don't know, except by, you know, all all cities trying to to act together rather than some of them trying to undercut other cities. Yeah. Isn't land ownership one of the question, one of the uh, solutions to this? Uh, in the Netherlands, it's uh, there's a lot of criticism that cities own the land and they also profit from selling it. So there's pressure on their own system to make a profit on something that maybe shouldn't be subject to that market mechanism. Um, does, does land ownership help? You mentioned the uh, innovation coastline of Brooklyn. Yes. That gives uh, cities the, power. The, yeah, the Brooklyn waterfront is, is you know, divided into privately held uh, uh, pieces of land and some publicly held pieces of land. Uh, so the privately held pieces of land can be developed any way the um, the private owner wants. There there has been no geographical master plan in New York. The development of this ten mile stretch of waterfront from Astoria in Queens through Brooklyn uh, south to the neighborhood of Sunset Park that is uh, part, <laughs> partly the result of market forces uh, and partly the result of uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Economic Development Corporation trying to act strategically on the large pieces of land that they control. But I am all for city ownership of land. Uh, there's huge pressure, as in Chinese cities, where the, the state owns all the land and uh, local governments are in charge of economic development, but the local governments make a direct profit from leasing the land, uh, so they are you know, very much concerned to be partners of the private sector rather than uh, oppressors of the of the private sector. So I'm all for I'm all for city ownership of land, but there the Brooklyn Navy Yard offers an interesting suggestion: uh, make that public ownership of land uh, bear social fruit by uh, limiting profits, reinvesting the profits in training the workforce, in uh, in building more modern infrastructure. Uh, with the with the revenue from city owned land come responsibilities. Is this a tactic that the innovation quarter can uh, apply, Rinka? Well, I think there are a lot of similarities between us and EDC, but we don't own land or buildings. What we do is we invest directly in companies, for mm -hmm. example. So, um, and we are very picky in what kind of companies we invest in. So it should be a financial return, but should also be a societal return. 
to being a life science company or a clean energy company, etc. So we look at the societal benefit of the innovation they're working at. Uh, but we're also responsible for attracting foreign companies to our region. And sometimes we, we get confronted, of course, by do we really want to have this company in our region? Have you ever said no? We have said no to we are not going to help you. But um, at the end of the day, that doesn't mean that the company can't set up shop in your region. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But what we did, in, in the first couple of years of our organization, we were really focusing on direct economic impact. So jobs, number of investments, number of projects. And then we said we should focus more on uh, strategic and economic impact. So is this company or this investment we're doing or this program we're running, is it really an add-on to the current ecosystem? And now we see more and more a shift to also bringing in societal impact. So mm -hmm. what is the influence of this investment we're doing or this foreign company we're attracting to a region on, for example, the SDGs. So there is, there is a, a famous example in Rotterdam um, where a British chemical company wanted to set up a, 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 a new factory that would have created a couple of hundreds of jobs, but would have been, the, I think, the sixth or seventh um, CO2 uh, 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 emitter in the Netherlands. And then you really have to ask yourself, okay, do we want this company here? The other choice was Antwerp, and you know, CO2 doesn't stop at the border. So, uh, or can you negotiate with this company that, uh, th that they balance the negative effects of their investment with a lot of uh, good things that they're potentially bringing? Mm -hmm. Is it also something which you reflect on, well, by reading the book, of course, the innovation for all principle. Is it also something, so how does it contribute to not only the, the ones who are in the tech system, but to, well, the jobs, which also Sharon refers to, which are disappearing also due to the, the transfer to the tech hub. So is it something you also reflect on how it's... How it can contribute to all the citizens of Rotterdam, well, I, for example? I, 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 think, I think the honest answer is yes and no. You know, we, we tend to believe in the trickle-down effect. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we invest at the top of the pyramid in these kind of companies, then a lot of other people will benefit from it. But I think we're becoming more and more aware that that is sometimes naive. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I'm not a fundamental believer in... Uh, you know, if there is a change to robotics, this will, will lead to, an, to a lot of new jobs in the robotics industry. I think we, we have to take a clear look at who are the winners and are the losers mm -hmm. of this tech revolution uh, and uh, what we can do to help the losers to take part in this revolution. I don't think you can stop the revolution. Uh, but I, I think you should l take a deep look at what can we do to help as, as many people as possible to benefit from it. And then it's about investing in education. It's in investing in lifelong learning. Uh, it's in, uh, so it's, it's also trying to bring the right developments to the right places. For example, if you look at Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam South, there's a lot to be won if there's more economic development there. And then uh, I, I believe in that trickle down effect will take place partially. At least will be better. They will be better off than, than in the current situation. Uh, but it's not only a, a question we can answer ourselves. A lot of responsibility here weighs on the shoulders of uh, of our governments. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have a question from uh, Rick Amado, who is uh, one of the uh, persons who took the initiative to build a new public school in Amsterdam Noord called uh, Klein Amsterdam, if I'm not mistaken. He's very interested in uh, education and how we can use the new economy to stimulate that. Mm -hmm. He says, what are the benefits to public schools in the city from these tech developments? Can you, is it, for example, uh, teaching children to code from an early age or uh, uh, new perspectives on a career that they might not have thought of otherwise? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Well, I do think that in that sense, um, it starts indeed um, at the, lower, at the um, primary school and think oh, in which way you can use tech in all different ways. And also... Um, Babies of one year old are already swiping on their bomb <laughs> iPhone. <side. laughs> but also um, after um, primary school, it becomes also very important that all, to have all these levels of education working together on, on these tech issues. And... Um, they all have their complementary values. So I think it's very important what I 
mentioned before as well, is that from from lower vocation education to uh, university degrees are working together on solving issues um, relating to all kinds of social issues where tech is also involved. Yeah, a project I really love is is Molenkeek. That's a, uh, a tech project in Molenbeek. Molenbeek is probably the the worst neighborhood in Brussels. Uh, you know, a lot of the terrorists, etc., were yeah, living infamous. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, a couple of people from the tech community set up a project there, Molenkeek, to help these young people to give them a, a, a new uh, perspective on a new future and to become uh, a, uh, uh, to be, become a coder and mm -hmm. become a techie. And I like these kind of initiatives, but mm -hmm. a lot of times they're too small and their 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 final imprint is too low yeah. but I, li I like these kind of yeah. initiatives we have yeah. our own uh, great uh, coding school here in amsterdam on the marine terrain yeah, i know yeah, just around the corner yeah. set up by uh, uh, corine vigreux of yeah. uh, tom tom yeah. uh, where a lot of young kids have, have really found a career for themselves that i don't know you'd know what would have happened to them otherwise yeah. I think no, I was just also referring to this, is that um, the in Utrecht there's also a nice example. It's called the Utrecht, Utrecht um, Challenge Alliance, where um, on all kinds of social issues, um, differing from um, healthy living yeah. challenges to nano-challenges, but students from lower vocation education up to um, the university colleges are working together on solving these, these issues. And I think that's, mm. these are very nice examples. Yeah. Mm. Sharon, well, you, you were I'm sorry, I was just going to, just going to add, uh, do not think, please, that New York is uh, lagging behind the, the other cities in uh, trying to establish mm -hmm. all kinds of social programs yeah to bring uh, everyone in the, the school age population into the new economy. There mm -hmm. are a lot of, of programs, a lot of initiatives. When I interviewed a high administrator in the uh, New York City Economic Development Corporation back in 2015, he said that uh, in the current uh, mayoral administration, there are uh, three criteria for uh, EDC investments, financial criteria, social criteria, and environmental criteria. So I think that, you know, I think every city government is aware that uh, this is, this is the, the good path. This is, the, uh, this is what they should be doing. I think every city, certainly New York, is trying to, um, to establish uh, uh, different kinds of quantitative reasoning and tech-ready courses uh, from kindergarten through the, the end of high school. Uh, it, the process seems to be very slow, and it has to be joined at the exit points with internships and yep. uh, <laughs> direct connections between the um, the the work the workforce in formation mm -hmm. and the tech industry. Katja, I wanted to uh, come back to something that you and I talked about on the phone beforehand about uh, the innovation district, the central innovation yep. district in The Hague. There are innovation districts, I think, all over the Netherlands, yeah. the tech campus in Eindhoven, the science park in Amsterdam. But the one in The Hague... Uh, something really interesting there happened. Uh, City Council sent the designers of this innovation district back to the drawing board because they hadn't met their goals for the numbers of homes and the numbers of jobs. Yes, correct. It uh, was sent back also due to the fact that um, they, th they thought that the, the services were not well enough included in the program. So, well, well. And um, indeed, so now the discussion is on, so for whom will this innovation district be built or the, the houses will be built? Um, that's an important discussion right at this moment. And also which service, services should be included in this um, in the central innovation district? Um, and for whom also will be the jobs that will be created? Mm. So this is, well, at the moment, an important discussion in, uh, in The Hague mm -hmm. regarding the central innovation district and the development. Yeah. yeah. Our office is right in the middle. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a district right in the center of The Hague. Yeah. Is there enough space to build so many new offices, so many new homes? Well, there are, to a certain extent, also re rebuild or um, reconstructing the buildings. So uh, redeveloping the buildings, uh, partly. Um, and there also uh, will be 
A lot of empty offices now with COVID, eh? That will be, well, rebuilt indeed as well, or recreated. So, um, but it will be, well, there will be, uh, there is, an, an, not only in The Hague, but there is an enormous housing shortage in, in the Netherlands in mm. almost every city. So here also the, there needs to be built, I think, about 22,000 um, buildings or houses in the upcoming year. So uh, it's, a, it's an enormous challenge for, um, for The Hague as well as in other cities. Because I, th I think this, this housing inequality is an enormous issue for oh, the cities. It's huge. Yeah, especially with the news this week of the new yeah. rise in prices here, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, we have a question from Tur Pluimen. He says uh, the world is becoming more connected and global, and cities are becoming more competitive. Does it make sense to try to change the innovation complex on a city or a national level, Sharon, or will tech companies just go to another city? that provides easier conditions. Of course, this is some of what we saw around the new uh, Amazon HQ2. They, I think oh. 237 cities applied for, Compe competed, competed, yes, for, competed wow. for them, yeah. um, uh, this is This is an excellent uh, question. Uh, it, 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 from the big co tech companies' point of view though, they have so much wealth now and they are operating in so many markets that they are just building complexes all over. I'm speaking about Google uh, and, and Facebook, uh, uh, and Amazon, of course, building warehouses, maybe more than, than offices, but they are literally building in, in big cities all over the world. And I think maybe under these conditions of this kind of expansion, which I believe is, is uh, unusual historically, uh, cities, if they can join together and set conditions, can try to set conditions, they might be successful um, because this, obviously big tech companies want to be in all of these cities at once, they, they don't, maybe they're not playing off one city against another all, all the time. I have a final question. We have a few more minutes, but maybe you do too. Please go. Okay. Um, I think we all remember in 2002 when Richard Florida mm -hmm. published his uh, uh, a study that made a huge splash, the creative class. Every mayor had that book on his night table. Everybody wanted Florida to come to their city. And uh, I think I saw him five times in the Netherlands and tell them how to, how to bring the creative class in because that was the solution for the future. What I wonder, Sharon, do you think that in uh, 20 years time, we will look back on the conversation we're having now and say, ah, oh, Remember, sort of nostalgically, remember when we thought that this was the issue and the solution of the future? Uh, when I visited Amsterdam in the early 2000s, I remember being taken on a really interesting tour of the Bruegelplatz, a, a part of the Creative City project in Amsterdam Nord. Uh, a very different vision of the use of that land than you you see now. So I already entertained the question that you ask, Tracy. <laughs> uh, yes, I yes, you know, it, 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 in, from from one point of view, the innovation complex is the paradigm of the post two thousand eight period, and we may. You know, we may move past that rapidly, uh, but I think that the no no city government is urging me to come to tell them what to do. Oh, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any delusions that uh, I am moving into Richard Florida's uh, uh, boots here. Hmm. Uh, I, I I think that the name of the policies may change but the strategies will remain the same. And I think Rinka probably knows much more about this than I do. This, the strategic goal is to make cities sustainable, uh, not just environmentally, but socially sustainable. 
you have to do that by creating jobs. How, how can the public sector do that when in the United States, the public sector doesn't even have the funds to build social housing? Mm. So this is, this is a really big question. And we've mm. touched upon the second big, second and third big questions. How do we educate the workforce for jobs? And third, how do we build less expensively or how do we control mm -hmm. housing costs? I have one final question from Walter Jan, our co-host of this evening, but uh, Katja, you had a remark? Just a small remark that um, uh, Richard Florida also wrote a new book on the, the new um, urban crisis in which he also reflects on the fact that all cities do become the places for the wealthy and the rich more and more. And yeah. Um, and also it relates to the tech and the tech development. So I, think, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought it was courageous of him to admit yeah, that he definitely. hadn't seen that yeah. coming. Yeah. 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 For me, there was an important lesson from what happened after Richard Florida published his book, is that a lot of cities forget to look at their own DNA. So you got Breda, the city of gaming. Mm -hmm. There was no evidence at all. And I think if... Breda uh, is now the city of 538. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> but I think if, if cities in Europe want to compete in this global competition for, for technology, they should stay really close to where their DNA is. Okay, okay, Rinke, the last question is for you, yeah. for sure. Um, Walter Jan wants to know, Amazon, what would uh, Innovation Quarters' response be if Amazon came to build their European headquarters in your area? Mm -hmm. Would you... Go along with that. What would your uh, well, requirements and demands be? I think I, th I think our first response, in all honesty, would be we're gonna we're gonna kick this. We're gonna we're gonna win this game. You know, we're gonna bring them in. We're gonna show them what we have to offer. He hasn't learned anything, has he? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> my first response would be. Oh, okay. And then, second? then, well, secondly, uh, it's important possible in my eyes that the kind of incentive schemes they were looking for in the US uh, that someone here is going to offer them yeah. only a part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if they want to come here, they should come here because they want to be part of our clusters and ecosystems and they have to add value to that. And that would be the lens through which we're looking at this potential investment. Mm -hmm. What are they going to add or are they just going to replace things we have? and what will be the effect of them coming here. But in all honesty, uh, if they call tomorrow, uh, we want to get in discussion to setting up our European headquarters in Rotterdam. Uh, I don't ask them to fly over here, I fly over there. Yeah. But it's a starting point of a discussion. <laughs> Absolutely. Fascinating. Well, let me thank you all, our audience, our guest of honor, Sharon Zukin, about her book, the Innovation Complex, the uh, code for your discount at Atheneum Bookstore is DCFA2122, DCFA2122. Thanks to Katja Rusinovic, thanks to Rinke um, Sonneveld. Sonneveld, dankjewel. Uh, to Master City Developer for bringing us all together here. And what a delight to actually be here physically with you and with Sharon Zukin from New York. Thank you all for joining Thank us. So Thanks for having Thank us.